Take a little trip with me, I'm gonna take you home. Take a little history. Take a little, take a little. Down this lane of memory. So let's raise another glass for the glorious past and the friends we have become. Yeah, yeah. Cause little did we know that good times come and go, but the best is yet to come. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. My guest today is the former Lieutenant Governor of Delhi and the former Vice Chancellor of Jamia Milia Islamia, Najib Jung. A week after the riots in Delhi, how does he view what happened in the capital? Mr. Jung, let me start by asking you how you would describe last week's violence in Delhi. Do you see it as a riot? Do you see it as targeted killing? Or do you think it's best described as a pogrom? I think it started as a a normal clash, the pro the pro CA uh, protesters against the anti CA protesters. That was the first day. I think from the second day onward, it did turn into a program. Uh, defining a program is the targeted killing of a particular community, and here I think from the second day onwards, most certainly, uh, the Muslim houses were targeted. The Muslim establishments were targeted. Now, there's no doubt that Hindus were also killed, Hindu properties were also damaged, but do you believe that the main thrust of the targeting was Muslim lives, Muslim houses, Muslim shops, Muslim businesses? I'm told so. Uh, I'm, I, people have been coming and seeing me. I think the damage, if you assess it fairly, would probably be 70, 30. So, uh, like I said, from the second day onwards, the tide has changed. The first day, I think there was almost an equal kind of a, of a fight. But uh, the second day onwards, uh, it had changed. Uh, more people, maybe from outside, had come in. And also, of course, we have the questionable behavior of the Delhi police. So on the second day, when it became a pogrom, as you think it's best described, the targeting was clear. The Muslims were the ones who were being hit. Yes, obviously. This was uh, uh, many 1984 confined to only the northeast of Delhi. That's a very interesting comparison. You're suggesting that this is of a pattern with the Sikh killings of 1984, and I presume also the Muslim killings in Gujarat of 2002. Once again, a particular community was the target, and that's where the direction of the violence was. And that is what I said. So history has repeated itself 40 years after, 50 years after 1884, 18 years after 2002. It is a very, very sad uh, uh, time in history, let me say, when social relations are collapsing and we don't see succor being provided by political parties. In Delhi, as you can see, the relief is only being provided by NGOs and social workers. The central government and the Delhi government are failing in providing relief. And so it's very, very clear. It's a very sad part of sad time in our lives. I think uh, we saw major clashes in 1947. But please remember, uh, Jawaharlal himself was out in the streets battling the crowds. In 1947, Gandhi comes back from Nawakali and rushes to Jamia and asks the people, is Zakir Sahib safe? Where is the central leadership? Where is the Delhi leadership? Why is it only left to activists to go there and provide relief? You made many important points there, and I want to pick up on all of them. And let's start with the police. Everyone today knows and accepts that the police completely failed. And that affected both sides, Hindus and Muslims. But activists say that whereas many Hindus have filed FIRs and are confident that the police will respond, I'm told not a single FIR has been filed by a Muslim, and that's because activists say they don't trust the police. As someone who knows the community, do you believe Muslims have lost faith in the police? I think the Muslims are losing faith in many institutions, including the police. The Muslims feel that going to a police station is a waste of time. On the contrary, they may ill-treat them. 
So what's the point of getting involved, going back repeatedly and asking questions and misbehaving? I can give you an example, Karan. A lady that I know, my wife knows, uh, she runs a school in the outskirts of Delhi. And that school largely caters to Muslim children. And she went to get her gun license renewed. And the SHO tells her that you are school chalati hain, aap saap ko dood pila rahi hain. It sent shudders down her spine. She was literally shaking when he sat back, she sat back in her car. So this speaks volumes of the communalization that has taken place in our system. But leave the police. How do you give four weeks or six weeks for the state to respond in case of a communal riot? That's what the judiciary has done. And just for optics, the bad optics to transfer Murli Dharan out, his transfer may have been on the cards. That's fair enough. The decision may have been taken weeks ago. That's fair enough. But you can't transfer a man at the stroke of midnight uh, because when he's hearing this case and he's taking a proactive interest. You said Muslims have lost faith in many institutions. The police is one. Is the judiciary another? Of course. You can see how they have behaved in this instant case. What? How can you expect a six-week time for government to respond when there is a riot flaring in Delhi? It should have been a day-to-day -day hearing. What are the other institutions that Muslims believe will not stand by them? Well, you know, it's, it's a really a crisis of confidence that is coming up. I mean, how do you think uh, a Muslim feels when he is hesitant to hang his nameplate on his door? How do you think he feels when his son is applying for a job and is afraid that he may be discriminated against? So there is across the board a feeling of, uh, a feeling of being unwanted. And being unwanted in your own country can be very, very depressing. You know, when you say Muslims have lost faith in the police, they've lost faith in the judiciary, that also means they don't believe they'll get justice in India. It's a feeling that is slowly creeping in. And I'm afraid we don't have somebody speaking to them to give them confidence that this feeling has to be countered. We don't have a Jay Prakash Narayan. We don't have, of course, a Gandhi and a Nehru to talk to them. Actually speaking, the only man of stature who can be heard and believed is the Prime Minister himself. And he must speak and give confidence to them. The, the word Sabka Vishwas has to now come into play. But you know, it's even worse than you're saying, because if Muslims have begun to lose confidence that they'll get justice, if there is no Jay Prakash Narayan or Nehru or Gandhi to speak to them and give them that confidence, then they are also losing confidence in the very system of India. Yes. Yes, I'm afraid so. I think we are sliding down a slippery slope. We have to counter it. They need hand-holding. Look, please understand, this is the poorest of the poor. They lack education. They lack leadership. We don't want them to get into the hands of Malvis with the silly fatwas coming from the seminaries. We want them to be modern-looking. So they need hand-holding. They need good educational institutions. This, this idea around us that there has been appeasement, whereas statistically that doesn't prove so. But it is an idea that has sunk into the Indian mind. That has to be countered. The appeasement is, a, is, a, is really an unfair word to a community that is really, really down in the dumps. But you know, if Muslims are at that point where they are losing confidence, or they have already lost confidence in India, then we're at a very dangerous point for 15% of our population. 200 million? I don't know if they have lost confidence, but certainly they are in the process of losing of, confidence. Of losing confidence. Uh, and they, that means losing confidence in the land of their birth. Yes. It is, it is, like I said, a very, very depressing thing for many people. People like me are very privileged. Look. I, I am not of that class, but, but I speak to a lot of people. I, I, uh, Jamia had 25,000 students. We speak to them. They come to us, and I can, see, I can see the concern in their eyes, the concern on their faces. This is a moment when the country, as you said, needs leadership. I want to 
ask you that question about the political response to what happened. What message were Muslims hearing both during the riots and afterwards from Narendra Modi and Amit Shah? Uh, a tweet from the Prime Minister and I don't recall seeing anything from the Honorable Home Minister. Uh, the message that did come, I think, on the end of the second day or third day was they sent Mr. Doval. And uh, he, his presence, I think, made a difference. He made uh, diplomatic statements like uh, everything will be all right, inshallah, and so on. But that's not enough. And I think, of course, Mr. Doval's uh, visit was critical because it did, it did help the police into getting into action. But if all they heard from the Prime Minister was the tweet and then silence, and there was deafening silence from the Home Minister, then the message that's going to Muslims presumably is they don't care about us. It's a very sad, it's a very sad um, time, yes. You, but do, please, you do agree that I, Muslims would have thought Modi and Shah don't care about us. I have said this repeatedly, that the time is such that the Prime Minister and the Home Minister must come on national television and speak clearly about the CAA, about the NRC and about the NPR. This is the time when the people who are protesting need to hear them. Instead, what we've got from the Prime Minister was a tweet where admittedly he called for calm, but he showed no compassion for the dead, no concern for the next of kin. Amit Shah didn't even do that. He hasn't spoken about the riots at all. Instead, he extols the CAA. What can I say? Like I said. But what impact does this have on Muslims? They are the ones who are suffering. They are the ones who feel they're forgotten, abandoned, unwanted, as you said. What impact does it have on them when their own government, to their eyes and to their ears, is unconcerned about them? Why blame only Mr. Modi and Mr. Shah? What about the other political parties? I'll come to them, but first let's talk about Modi and Shah. Well, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry and sad that they have not come out and confronted this huge, huge monster in their own backyard. It's not acceptable. This is a dereliction of a moral responsibility that as Home Minister and Prime Minister they have failed to fulfill. I won't put in such harsh words. I mean, I'm not going to, to speaking like that, but speaking in more moderate language, I think, uh, I think that Muslims are indeed very, very disappointed. In fact, over the weekend, Mr. Shah was in Calcutta. He held rallies. And people in his rally were shouting loudly on television, Goli Maro Salonko. And not only did Mr. Shah not criticize and condemn, he hasn't even distanced himself from it. Yes, that's true. And we are also, like I said, everybody watches from a distance. I mean, you know, meet a lot of non-Muslims, meet a lot of Hindus, and even they are saying that this is the limit. We didn't expect this from them. And this is now coming from BJP supporters. It was happening in Rajiv Chonk in Delhi two days ago. Yes. And no FIRs. People carried away. We don't know what happened to those jokers who were carried away. In fact, away. the police reports in the papers suggest that the five or six boys at Rajiv Chonk were first detained and then released because they were deemed to be, in quotations, innocent. Yes. That is the sad state. So, Goli Maro Salonko is becoming innocent and acceptable. It's not considered in the police eyes sedition. It's not considered incitement to violence because people detained have then been released. It is standard language now. What message does that send to Muslims? That Goli Maro Salonko, where the Muslim is the Salo, what message does it send that this is standard language? It's, it's really a pity. And I'm sorry that no one is speaking about it. It's a larger pity that Muslims themselves have no leadership. Look, consider this. Do you know of any leader, Muslim leader of national stature, who can stand up and say, or go to Shine Bagh, or go to the But that's a secondary matter, surely. The Muslims don't need a leader for the Goli Maro Salonko to stop. That is wrong, regardless of whether they have a leader or not. And yet, no one in the BJP, not the Prime Minister, not the Home Minister, has said a word about it. The police saw it happen in Rajiv Chowk and did nothing. And the judiciary, isn't pushed to act either. Indeed, indeed. So we are all watching in a very helpless manner. So all these institutions, the executive, the judiciary, the police, are not acting. They just don't care what is said. They don't see it as a crime. I think that we have reached a point where 
the Muslims have been pushed into a corner and that's unfortunate. There's still time to retrieve ground and like I say, it is time for the Honorable Prime Minister to come out and speak to them. Do you really believe he will? A whole week has gone by and beyond a single tweet, he hasn't said a thing. Current darkness begets darkness. We have to come into light and we have to hope for it. We have to hope for love. The Prime Minister has been elected by also the Muslims of India. But look at the instances in the past when Christians were targeted, when cow lynchings targeted Dalits and Muslims, when the Prime Minister spoke up, it was after a long, long, long gap, and he spoke up almost tangentially rather than directly. Yeah. And he's only spoken out once. A whole week has gone by since the riots. You may be hoping he'll speak, but are you really believing he will? No, I don't think he will. You don't think he will? No, I don't think he will. You don't have the confidence that when your Prime Minister needs to show moral leadership, he will. That's what you're saying? Well, no. I, what I'm saying is that what he has said in public, that I can't speak on every instance. If I start speaking on every instance, then when will I end is speaking? Is this every instance? It's a pity, but that's how it's being looked at. Let's come to Arvind Kejriwal, because in Delhi, the government in power is Arvind Kejriwal, his chief minister, and the Ahmadmi party. And I would imagine most, if not the majority of Muslims in Northeast Delhi voted for Ahmadmi. In their hour of need, did the Ahmadmi party stand by them or do Muslims feel let down and betrayed? I think the Muslims are feeling more let down by Mr. Kejriwal than by the BJP government. What? Because there were bigger hopes from Kejriwal than from them. I mean, they did not expect much great things from, from the BJP government or the NDA government. But here was a government. Mr. Kejriwal came on a platform of providing succor to the poor, on being a secular man, that is being denied. They have been absent from the field completely. I mean, with all this fasting and this fashion of being uh, on, an, on, an, on an indefinite fast, I would think that Mr. Kejriwal would have gone on an indefinite fast sitting in the heart of northeastern Delhi till peace came in. And that actually would have made him into a national leader. But here he has taken many steps back. In television studios, Ahmadmi Party spokesmen insist that their MLAs, their councillors are in the locality, they're working with people, they're reaching out. You're suggesting to me that that may be simply television studio talk. Well. Uh, Anjali Bhardwaj has released a six-page uh, page memo on who's present in the field and who's not present in the field. And Ahmad people, is missing. They are completely missing. They have provided these large tents from Ren Baseras for people to stay, but that's not important. What is important is medicine, uh, bandages, biscuits, food, milk. It's civil society that is providing them this, not the Ahmadni Party. Look. Providing 10 lakhs of rupees to someone dead or 1 lakh from, ta from taxpayers' money doesn't replace life. Your human touch replaces. That you must human touch is missing from Ahmadmi. I think that Mr. Kejriwal and Manish and company should have been out embracing these old women and men who have been hurt. I think the Ahmadmi, uh, they have army of volunteers who should be out rebuilding these homes, both of Hindus and Muslims. That's how you rebuild society. In the press, people speculate that Mr. Kejriwal and the Ahmadmi party are not out on the streets embracing elderly Muslim women, holding the hands of men who've suffered because they don't want to lose the Hindu vote. They don't want to offend Hindu voters. Is that how the affected Muslims also see it? That became evident when Mr. K. J. Wal and company did not visit Shain Bagh even once. That became evident when they did not visit the Jamia Millia Islamia. That became evident when we don't have a statement on the violence in Aligarh Muslim University. It became evident that you're looking at another vote which is in larger numbers. But the Muslims had no choice but to vote for him. Because and they couldn't the, vote for BJP. That is the whole problem. But then look at the situation the Muslims face. They look at the BGP and they say, Ye to hamari party ho nahi sakti. They look at our Aadmi and say, there was a possibility Hamari ho sakti hai, but they've let us down. And Congress isn't worth voting for. Do Muslims feel they don't have a political choice in this country? No matter where they turn, that party doesn't care about them. Yes, indeed. I mean, they thought that the Samajwadi party was a great party for them, but look what happened in Muzaffar Nagar. 
let's not forget i mean we are talking of the nda but let's not muzaffar let's not forget muzaffar nagar maybe maybe is yeah 7 8 years ago so who do they turn to that's the big question there isn't a single party that's prepared to stand up support and help and stand by muslims coming to the crunch it is the larger vote that matters and that's the hindu vote that's the hindu vote and everyone's scared of losing it which is why they won't stand by muslims and actually if you look at a larger canvas it is secularism in india that is taking a beating that is the problem i think that this modest liberal voice of india is now lost in the wilderness in in you know in some uh, some newspapers that may be writing about it i hear from the telegraph i hear the hindu or the indian express or the wire but where is the liberal voice being counted these are uh, this is now you know call the lip tards or the khan market types or whatever so out in the field out in mohallas out in villages where the liberal voice should be heard and felt it's missing it is completely missing because they don't have now the organs of 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 uh, uh, the press with them anymore i'm going to end this part by asking you a difficult question about your successor I know you probably don't want to talk about your success it's an embarrassing thing to do but you've been governor how do you assess mr bejel's performance during this ride it's a difficult and an embarrassing question that you ask me and i wish you hadn't asked me uh, to be to be honest bejel saab should have been more proactive i think we should have seen a greater commander in the field uh, i think he should have visited and stayed there a little more i'll i'll put it at that if you had been lieutenant governor during the right would you have called out the army the army uh no i don't think so i don't think with a 80000 police force at your command which is trained they have a 8000 crore annual budget they are trained they are well equipped uh, i would have trusted them and given them leadership the problem here was that the leadership failed look when the dcp was injured and fell that is the time when the senior police leadership completely collapsed and the and the juniors were left to left rudderless more or less there was another point when another dcp ved surya was standing beside kapil mishra as kapil mishra issued inflammatory statements and threatened that if the police didn't clear everything in 3 days he would do it himself and the dcp stood there smiling if you'd been lieutenant governor based on that video clip he would have been suspended in 5 minutes you would have done that immediately immediately there's no question of even asking an explanation it was very clear by the start of the second day the 25th that the police were responding lethargically if they were responding at all it was very clear that they were standing by it was very clear that often the police themselves were prodding muslim boys one of whom fazan later died it was very clear that the police were also throwing stones that would have been apparent to you if you were lieutenant governor would you at that point have rang up amulia patnaik the then commissioner and said what is going on i would have kept in touch with uh, amulia patnaik from day 1 so this situation in day 2 would not have arrived let me give you an example of the tilokpuri riots in 2015 i think it was 2015 maybe 2014 a similar situation was coming up but it was controlled by the same delhi police within a few hours deepak mishra who was the special commissioner of police was on the field himself all the time and you were lieutenant governor at the time that is right so Ran- were you in constant touch with the all the time Ranbir Singh who was the joint CP addressed a large meeting in the community hall that was uh, by by and large Hindus and Ranbir said ke pehli goli meri bandook se chalegi agar yahan garbad hogi so if you had been lieutenant governor when the riots happened in delhi you would have been personally in touch with the dcps and amulya patnaik and you would have ensured that they exercised the leadership we now discover they failed to exercise you would have ensured they did it i would have made sure yes and this is why you say mr bejel should have been more proactive mr bejel should have been a commander he didn't show that command i wish he had been more in the field and more in command yes i'll take a break at that point when i come back i want to raise a very different question
six years after Mr. Modi became Prime Minister. What does it feel like to be a Muslim in India today? We'll be back in a moment's time, but first a message from our sponsor, Glenn Livid, whilst I take a reassuring sip from this glass. Take a little trip with me, I'm gonna take you home. Take a little history. Take a little, take a little. Down this lane of memory. So let's raise another glass for the glorious past and the friends we have become. Yeah, yeah. Cause little do we know the good times come and go, but the best is yet to come. Welcome back to a special interview for The Wire. My guest is the former Lieutenant Governor of Delhi and the former Vice Chancellor of Jamia Millia Islamia, Najib Jang. Mr. Jang, over the last six years, we've seen Gharwapsi in Love Jihad, anti Romeo squads in cow lynching, and then most recently, there's been the abrogation of Article 370, the public celebration over the Ram Mandir verdict, and of course, CA and NRC. At the end of all of this, what does it feel like to be a Muslim in Modi's India? I, uh, I, this is a, a difficult one for me because I do belong to the more privileged lot amongst Muslims who don't directly feel the brunt of what others are feeling. So let me deflect this question into what the arm Muslim is feeling. If you go to a young girl met me from, from the Northeast and she quoted a couplet from Sahir and she says, Yaha mulk ke rehbaron ko bulao, ye kunche ye galiya ye manzar dikhao, jinhe naz hai hind par unko lao, jinhe naz hai hind par wo kaha hai. She also quoted another one and she says, Jalta tha jo ghar mera, log ye kehte the, Kya aag sohani hai, kya aach suneri hai. It's six years of something that they have been seeing. It's a relentless pressure on the community that are they welcome enough? How are their neighbors looking at them? If you, if a Muslim, if a Muslim girl marries a Hindu boy, it's fine. If a Muslim boy is looking at genuine love with a Hindu girl, it becomes jihad. All this is building up and I am afraid that lack of Muslim leadership, a stronghold of Muslim Maulanas and silly fatwas and I use the word silly coming from the seminaries, lack of education, lack of employment opportunities and above all a lack of really hand holding from government, the government of the day is really causing great consternation and a deep sadness. There was a sentence you used in the first half of this interview that I want to bring back into the conversation. You said, Muslims feel unwanted in the land of their birth. That's a terrible thing for anyone. But can you explain what is that feeling like? Because I don't think any other Indian ever feels unwanted in India. And yet here are 200 million of our brothers and sisters born and brought up and belonging to this country and they feel unwanted in their own land. What does that feel like? I really don't know what a young man feels like when he's wearing a sculpt cap and sitting in a train compartment and he feels a fear. The fear that people around him are looking at him. The fear that somebody will misbehave with him. A fear that somebody may scratch, snatch his skull cap. I don't know how he feels. I don't know the real pain that the Muslims in the Northeast are feeling when they see a repetition of 1992 when a young man climbs up the minaret of a mosque to, to, to hang a flag. It's, it's something, look, Delhi is not a Mufassil town. It is, not, it is not hidden away in some corner of some state in India. This was maybe seven, eight miles from Raisina Hill. So to describe how a Muslim in North India particularly, I think the South India they are a little better off. Uh, a Muslim in UP or a Muslim in Bihar 
would feel is almost impossible to describe in words. I think it requires someone like Anurag Kashyap to make a film on the feelings that are going through the Muslim mind. But you began with a very telling example. You said it's hard to know what a Muslim sitting on a train wearing a skull cap feels when people around him look at him askance and he's worried about his safety. He's worried about his life. In other words, Muslims often spend their time in public worried about their safety, worried about their life. They are concerned about their safety. It's exactly what the Sikhs went through in 1984. You don't the know same when feeling. you'll be hit. You don't you know, don't know when, when you'll, you'll be, be hit. hit. You don't know where you'll be hit. Who will catch you? That's and then not, who do you go to? That's not a fear the rest of us live with. I walk the streets, millions and hundreds of millions of Hindus walk the streets. It never occurs to us that we'd be in danger, unless of course some gunda does that. But we never fear that because we are Hindu, we'll be targeted. You're saying Muslims live in constant fear that because they are Muslims and identifiable, they could be beaten, they could be even worse killed. I'm not saying constant fear, but, but I'm, saying, I'm saying that there is a degree of fear amongst, amongst a certain class of Muslims. This is why they feel unwanted in India. Yes, a large section are now feeling that are they wanted enough? Is this, is this uh, going to be the life of their children? In an article you wrote for the Indian Express just a couple of days ago, you said, and I'm quoting, minorities in India are slowly coming to believe that there's a campaign to make them second-class citizens. That's how, I presume, you see the treatment of Muslims. Yes. Is exactly what is happening in the last uh, five, six years. There's a sustained movement which is uh, perceived as being... Uh, not sympathetic enough for Muslims. Whether you look at the CA, whether you look at 370, whether you look at Triple Talaq, whether you're going back, you look at the lynchings and the lack of action on lynchings. All this is, you know, it's, it's an inexorable pressure of a certain kind, uh, which is building up. And for such a pressure to be consistent for 200 million is, is dangerous. And Muslims today are conscious that they are being treated as second-class citizens. They feel it in their hearts. They feel that they are not getting a fra fair treatment, yes. Something that they have to contend with is that Mohan Bhagwat and the RSS don't even accept that Muslims have a distinct cultural identity. The RSS's position is that anyone born in this country is culturally Hindu. When Muslims who know that they have a great tradition, cultural and religious, keep hearing that culturally you're Hindu, what does it do to them? It's just not the Muslims. The Sikhs feel the same. They are told repeatedly that you're actually Hindu. So is the Christian, the Muslims, the, the Jews, whatever their number may be, everyone is told that being Hindustani, you are a Hindu. I am saying that I am a Hindustani Muslim or the Sikhs say that I'm a Hindustani Sikh. Look, the Sikhs are the best. For, they took the best of Islam and Hinduism. Guru Nanak is a Fear for Muslims. You can't tell a Sikh that you are a Hindu. Please tell him you are a Hindustani. And likewise, uh, the Muslim with pride. And today you can see with these women in Shine Bagh, you know, the constitution in their hand, singing, singing Vande Matra with pride. The greatest advantage of the CAA has become that suddenly, uh, suddenly they have found a new identity. I'll come to that in a moment's time. But first I want to ask you this, in the last few years, the names of streets and cities that have a cultural or historical Muslim residence have been changed. As a result, Allahabad has become Prayagraj, Mughal Sarai has become Deen Dyal Upadhyay Junction, Faizabad has become Ayodhya. And when Muslims see this happening, steadily if not increasingly, do they begin to feel that there's an attempt being made to erase our role in India's culture and history? While the latter part of your statement may be correct that they, they feel that, you know, uh, history is being rewritten and their role may be, may be sort of uh, put in a, uh, in a lesser category, I don't think they're really concerned about changing names. They probably expect this to happen and more of this to happen. But certainly uh, they, they are aware. Even that is sad. They expect this to happen. They expect more of it to happen. In other words, they already know in their mind that our name, whether it's a city or a city, will change. 
Hinduization will replace the old Islamic identity of streets and, and of cities. It's a phase of history that is, that is happening, yes. And it's a phase of history that's attempting to wipe out their role in it. Well, why not wipe out, but certainly denigrate their role in history. You can't wipe out, and you, you can't wipe out uh, 700 years of a history, but you can certainly denigrate it. Against this background, how do you view the anti-CA, anti-NRC protests? As you were suggesting a moment ago, here you have Muslims of all ages, of both sexes, standing up with the constitution in one hand and the flag in the other. They may be wearing skull caps and hijabs, but they're singing the national anthem in Vande Mataram, and with pride they are proclaiming they are Indian. How significant is this? This has really been a turning point in the lives of many, many Muslims. Uh, because I, in my own uh, lifetime, didn't imagine the hijabi women coming out and, and behaving in, in such a fashion. They have found a new voice. They have actually put men in the background. So men are actually doing peripheral services, running around, buying samosas, putting up a mic, and so on. But it's the women who are leading this movement. And, uh, and I'm sorry to say that the government is not reaching out to them. I have said this repeatedly, that Shaheen Bagh is only a symbol. And I think it's outlived its purpose, to be frank. The women should make way now. They have done it, and they should let the traffic move. But it has become a symbol of, of uh, anti-CAA protest across the country. And like I wrote in my piece, these protests are not going away. And therefore, if they continue, there is the fear of a Northeast Delhi type incident happening in other parts of India. In other words, the riots we saw last week in Delhi could happen elsewhere. They could happen at any time, at any place and at any level. And presumably they could happen in Delhi again as well. I think Delhi has taken enough of a beating. So I don't expect uh, a riot of this magnitude taking place in Delhi for many years. But you could see it in Bombay, you could see it in Bangalore, you could see it in UP, Bihar. I am imagining in smaller towns. I am imagining that, uh, that uh, the smaller municipalities with less police force, uh, it would happen, yes. But coming back to the anti-CAA, the anti-NRC protests, you said this is a turning point. Would I be right in assuming this is a turning point for two reasons? One, Muslims who we've always assumed were a bit aloof and kept away are now asserting themselves and demanding their rights. And more importantly, perhaps, they are now deliberately and consciously joining with Hindus, Christians, Buddhists, Sikhs, and they are making themselves part of the mainstream. The Muslims have always been a part of the mainstream. This is a myth. I mean, what is this mainstream? They have always voted. You can see them in every facet of your life. Your baker is a Muslim. Your barber is a Muslim. Your kuli is a Muslim. They've always been here. So was this perception that they were aloof mistaken? Absolutely mistaken. They have been around all the time. Was it that in fact they've been around and they're part of the mainstream, but their presence was not acknowledged by others? Now it can't be denied. Because they have come to the forefront in a very blunt manner because they, they perceive that they've been pushed to a wall and they can't take it anymore. They're fighting back. They're fighting back, yes. And that is what I fear, that the fighting must never become violent. Let us understand that this non-violent protest must not give way to any kind of Islamist uh, you know, act activism coming in. That could happen. That could happen. Of course it could happen. But you're saying there are two dangers. One, the first danger is that if you don't reach out, if you don't speak to them, you will see outbreaks of the sort of riots we saw in Delhi. Pogrom was actually what it became on the second day, yes. happening in other places. And the second thing you're saying is it could also acquire a much more overtly Islamist hue. Yes, I'm afraid of that. What happens to a young man whose sister has been ill-treated in a riot? What happens to a young man who's seen his mother and sister beaten up uh, by the police in, in a state? These are all very dangerous things for young men. Look at the statistics of the people who have been killed in these Delhi riots. About 80% would be between the ages 20 and 40, the prime of their lives. It's dangerous. Meanwhile, 
Narendra Modi and Amit Shah have said that Shaheen Bagh and other similar protests are a conspiracy to break up India. How do you respond to that? I think these are, these are just statements meant to be heard and really they, they also don't believe it. They can't believe it. But does it affect and influence others? Could it in fact start to influence many Hindus and therefore change their attitude to what's happening in Shaheen Bagh, change their attitude to the Muslim community? Is there a danger that this sort of false representation of Shaheen Bagh and the protests could create the sort of Hindu-Muslim divide you don't want? There is an obvious danger of a Hindu-Muslim divide in the continuation of these protests. And that is why I said that Shaheen Bagh has outlived its purpose. They must move away. Having said that, uh, there, if these are to continue, if economic life is to be disturbed, if you carry on these protests and people, and largely Muslims join, then there is obviously a fear that it will become, uh, become a pro-Muslim kind of a movement. So then how do you see the way forward? If Shaheen Bagh has outlived its utility, and yet you also believe that if Muslims are not reached out to, if their concerns are not attended to, there will be more protests, then how do you see the future? At least Shaheen Bagh is a peaceful protest. The others that you say may be more like riots in Delhi. Two things here. Uh, a, I think that the government must make a serious attempt to talk to them. But there's no sign of that at all. Yes, that's a pity. I've been saying it repeatedly that Mr. Shah did make a statement uh, that I'm willing to talk, give me three days start notice. But when the I'll... women tried to go, they were prevented by the police. Well, the women made a clumsy attempt. Uh, no, but they didn't seek made time. no attempt to reach out to them either. Yeah, but th a proper attempt should have been made by seeking time by a group of people, which they did not do. Anyway, that's beside the point. I think that a serious attempt has to be made by government talk, to talk just not to protesters, but to political parties, to opinion makers, to, to people like yourself, to come and see and resolve this issue. Because look at it. There we are actually endangering the entire census process by saying that we'll go ahead by the NPR. Pranab Sen has already made that clear. But let me come back. You're saying a serious attempt should be made by the government to talk to the protesters, to talk to political parties. It's not happening. There's no sign of it happening. The government shows no inclination of wanting to do it. So then what? If the government doesn't make that serious attempt, then what? If a mother doesn't understand what the child is going through, then there's going to be a problem at home. When a mother doesn't understand what a child is going through, the child effectively becomes an orphan and effectively gets disenchanted and leaves home. Is that what's going to happen? Well, Are we making orphans of our Muslim community? Like I said, I, I, don't, I won't use that word, but I'm saying it is leading to disenchantment. And I'm not a soothsayer. I can't see see much in the future, but I'm seeing a, dis uh, a distress situation. And the situation has the potential to get a lot worse unless Mr. Modi, Mr. Shah step in and start taking the corrective action you've said they should. They must do so immediately. But if they don't, it could get a lot worse. I believe that both Mr. Modi and Mr. Shah are patriots in the sense that we expect them to be. And when they see this, this agitation going in the way it is, they will come out and talk to these people. Except that Mr. Shah was at a rally in Calcutta where Godi Maro Sanuko was said and he didn't criticize it and he didn't even distance himself. And Mr. Modi is amongst those who refers to Shaheen Bagh as a conspiracy to break up India. He even at one point said you can recognize the protesters from their clothes. So I'm not sure where your confidence in them comes from. I, I hope you're right for the sake of the country. But my last question, if Mr. Shah and Mr. Modi don't heed your advice, the situation has the potential to get a lot worse. Mark Antony said this of when Julius Caesar died, that what a fall there was, my countrymen, when all of us, when all of us fell down and mighty treason flourished over us. I think, I think that we don't want the country to collapse. I don't want, I don't think we want social order to collapse. I don't think the Prime Minister will want to see shine uh, North East Delhi's happen again and again. Look, the world is looking at us. We should be talking of fighting the coronavirus. We should be f looking at, 
at, at the economy. We should be looking at giving employment to the young. We should not be wasting our time in holding riots, in controlling riots. But the interesting thing is the way you began that answer by quoting Mark Antony. You didn't say it in so many words, but the clear hint and suggestion was that is a possibility which we must at all cost avoid. Mr. Jung, a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.